Welcome to the Guillermo Aviles Lecture Series. My name is Phil Lawler. I'm the Senior Fellow at the Thomas More Center at Thomas More College. The full name of our center is the Center for the Restoration of Christian Culture. And we recruited five speakers for our lecture series to offer perspectives on that theme, how to restore Christian culture, with a special focus on the five areas of interest for the Thomas More Center, interests that we share with our patron, St. Thomas More. They are education and the liberal arts, family life, civic involvement, the arts, and the integrity of the Catholic faith. The Guillermo Aviles lectures are intended to spark thoughts and discussions on these topics. We deliberately chose speakers to offer provocative perspectives. So welcome to a week of intellectual challenges. We're grateful for the donors who made possible this lecture series. We're grateful too for you, to you for taking part in our discussions. If this is your first encounter with the Thomas More Center, I invite you to explore our website and learn more about our offerings, and particularly add your name to the mailing list to receive notice of other public events and our other offerings. Tonight, I'm happy to present Catherine Pakalik, an old friend now serving as Assistant Professor of Social Research and Economic Thought at the Catholic University of America. She is the recipient of the Novak Award, offered annually by the Acton Institute for significant contributions to the study of a relationship between religion and economic liberty. Her accomplishments include a doctorate from a Harvard and a family of eight children, so you know she can handle challenges. But tonight she is offering a challenge to you, the listener, with her talk. The Seton Option, Schools, Religion, and the New Science. Catherine Pakalik. Good evening. I'm honored and delighted to be with you tonight, even in this strained format, and grateful to the work of the Center for the Restoration of Christian Culture and Thomas More College for arranging this fine lecture series. As it happens, I'm recording these remarks for you in the great state of New Hampshire, in the Mount Washington Valley, adjacent to the great presidential range of the White Mountains. My felt nearness to you makes it easier to imagine that we are together in person. And so I offer these remarks to you very much as if I were with you in person. The subject of my remarks is education, as you'll have understood from my title. I will then in part one, offer some reasons why schools should be understood to belong a priori to the domestic society and therefore why they must be religious. In part two, I will aim to show how thinking of schools in this way complements and as it were completes C.S. Lewis's insights into education and into science in his Riddle lectures. At last, in short conclusion, I will argue for the priority of what I call the Seton option over other options advanced by our critics of modernity. There is, however, a prequel to this subject matter, a part zero, if you will, with which many of you will already be familiar. By way of introduction, then, I'll offer a bit of this prequel, since it will help to bolster a point that is implicit throughout this lecture. The crisis of the secular school isn't itself merely a crisis from the perspective of faith. It is rather an existential crisis for the school itself. Secular schools, to the extent that they succeed in being secular, cease being schools at all. They don't just fail to teach the gospel, they end up failing to teach reading and writing to say nothing of the habits and virtues to which education aims. And so I wanna state at the outset that like the Leonine popes, we can have tremendous confidence that what our faith urges, a Christian education for each child is no project of ghettoization, but instead, in fact, the light of the world. Nothing highlights the spirit of a zeitgeist more than the curious fact that the 19th century progressives of all political types strained for government sponsored, legislatively supported structures of universal and compulsory education. By and large, they succeeded 
and the history is fascinating, though a subject for another day. Take, for instance, Nassau Sr., a British lawyer and economist, a friend of John Stuart Mill, educated at Eton and Magdalen College, Oxford, who, in a statement almost perfectly representative of the age, urged in 1861 that, quote, while legislating for what remains of the 19th century, we ought not be diverted from the conduct which we think most beneficial now by our wishes or by our hopes as to what may occur in the latter part of the 20th century. So far as we are influenced by those wishes or hopes, we ought to try and prepare the way for their realization by giving to the present generation an education which will fit them to educate still better another education, which in time may further improve a third until England becomes what no country has ever yet become, a utopia inhabited by a self-educating and well-educated laboring population. So one may well ask what wishes and hopes Nassau Senior wished his peers to set aside. These he made plain were those which looked forward, quote, to the time when the laboring population, the working class, may be safely entrusted with the education of their children. He quickly added, no Protestant or civilized country believes that this time has come, and I see no reason to hope for it until generation after generation has been better and better educated. By the end of the 20th century, however, indeed the latter part indicated by senior, it had become impossible to maintain even the most guarded optimism about government schooling. In 2001, Diane Ravitch, the NYU education scholar and former deputy secretary of education, wrote the following in her book, Left Back, A Century of Battles Over School Reform. Quote, the utopianism that had once been associated with universal education, and I say exactly that utopianism that Nassau Senior possessed, she continued, had dissipated. By century's end, elementary and secondary schools were readily available for all young people and higher education was accessible for nearly all who wanted it. But serious problems persisted. What kind of problems? Large and serious ones to be exact. On the matter of quality, the American public schools assessed by Ravitch are in fact failing to get more than about one quarter of their 12th graders to proficiency, a low standard in mathematics measured on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. This means that 75% of 12th graders are not proficient in math. And the average hides a great deal of variation. Only 7% of African-American 12th graders are currently proficient in math, meaning over 90% of black high school students do not master basic maths before finishing high school. Left back indeed. Worse, Progress in these proficiency measures have been stagnant at best. Writing for the Brookings Institution, Jonathan Rothwell points out, quote, for the nation's 17 year olds, there have been no gains in literacy since the National Assessment of Educational Progress began in 1971. Performance is somewhat better on math, but there has still been no progress since 1990. Though apparently it is no longer a question of paternalism as senior envisioned where the competent state takes on a role that parents are unable or unfit to take on. Parents on their own, no matter how badly educated, could scarcely do worse. But what about some of those lofty social goals, such as integration, equality, and civic education, which alone, it seems, could justify state schooling in the face of such ineptitude? Regrettably, these two have turned up empty-handed the social aspirations of the American Education Project, such as correcting inequality and segregation, show no real sign of improvement. Eric Hanushek and Paul Peterson, education scholars, indicate that, quote, the achievement gaps have not narrowed over the past 50 years, despite all the money spent on that objective. On the matter of civics, my friends, you will have no doubt about the dismal state of things. And so Ravitch summarized 20 years ago, few believed anymore that schools alone could remedy the great ills of social and economic life or eliminate poverty. 
Thus, to the embarrassing academic record of the American public schools, one must add that they cannot count any putative social achievements. There are none to be counted. And all of this in spite of the outlay at the federal level alone of almost $500 billion in compensatory education and another $250 billion on Head Start programs for low-income preschoolers. What went wrong? Reflecting on nearly the same pattern of facts, but 30 years earlier, Ivan Illich observed, between 1965 and 1968, over $3 billion were spent on US schools to offset the disadvantages of about 6 million children. Yet no significant improvement can be detected in the learning of these, quote, disadvantaged children. He argued, this total failure to improve the education of the poor, despite more costly treatment, can be explained in three ways. Either $3 billion are insufficient to improve the performance of 6 million children by a measurable amount, or the money was incompetently spent, different curricula, better administration, further concentration of the funds on the poor child, and more research are needed and would do the trick. Or finally, educational disadvantage cannot be cured by relying on education within the school. Note that Ivan Illich here does not say, as Ravitch said, that we must be disabused of the notion that schools can improve say social and economic disadvantage or poverty. Rather, Illich says that schools cannot cure educational disadvantage, a shocking claim. A third of a century before Ravitch penned Left Back, Illich argues that schools do not even accomplish the very thing we suppose they exist to do. And so to evaluate his claim in light of the broad failure of American public schools, we shall need to ask what it is that schools do I believe that the answers are more complex and more interesting than typically supposed. There are three primal stories that we can tell about what schools do. Each one is a kind of abstraction, but the benefits of the abstraction, as with all modeling, assist in clarifying hidden assumptions and revealing weaknesses in how we think about schools. I call them primal because each presents a, redu a reduced form intuition about what is going on in a school. Also primal because they do not presuppose any particular school form. In a sense, they are primary models of education and not schooling. The first story recounts what we might generously call the workshop model of a school, less generously the factory model here, the child is raw material that goes in and comes out as an educational product. Children as raw materials are passive and also inanimate. Agency must perforce lie entirely with educators or parents. Importantly, without another assumption, schools in this model act uniformly or identically on each child. The school has an independent quality or a mark which is stamped or imparted on each child. Now, whatever its drawbacks, it is obvious that this model is not entirely wrong, even if we find it somewhat infelicitous. Certainly, there are many fine examples of schools that aim to make their students into men and women of a certain form, for instance, into Eton men or Harvard men. We do find this less offensive and also more believable than that schools should claim to be able to make a uniform intellectual stamp. But the uniform intellectual stamp is precisely what the production function model of schooling wishes us to take seriously. The best one can do, I think, for the factory model is to revise it into the refinery model or the craftsman workshop, where children are molded, perhaps by edu educators qua artisans. I think this is a supportable idea, but probably suggests an upper limit on student teacher or craftsman ratios far below what is commonly imagined now to be affordable or sustainable. We might reasonably imagine that a small workshop craftsman might impose or devise a different approach for each ball of clay. But the idea that this happens routinely or often in medium or often in medium to large scale public schools beggars belief. Instead, educators themselves to say nothing of students find their efforts overwhelmed by a Goliath system 
that can no more see the child than it can understand its own insufficiency. As John Taylor Gatto notes, quote, I've, no I've noticed a fascinating phenomenon in my 30 years of teaching. Schools and schooling are increasingly relevant to the great enterprises on the planet. No one believes anymore that scientists are trained in science classes or politicians in civics classes or poets in English classes. The truth is that schools don't really teach anything except how to obey orders. This is a great mystery to me, he says, because thousands of humane and caring people work in schools as teachers and aides and administrators. But the abstract logic of the institution overwhelms their individual contributions. Although teachers care and do work very, very hard, the institution is psychopathic. It has no conscience. It rings a bell and the young man in the middle of writing a poem must close his notebook and move to a different cell where he must memorize next that humans and monkeys derive from a common ancestor. The force of Gatto's statement is that it highlights not only the question about the abstract logic of the factory, but also that the disintegration of the curriculum is not separate from the logic of the institution. The medium is also the message. Cages, indeed cages and warehouses and industrial sheds, dirty, smelling, stinking places are suitable places of learning for descendants of monkeys. The second model is the garden model as in a kindergarten where we conceive of children as seeds or plants. Edith Stein was a great proponent of this model. And so she writes, I quote, the soul is not inanimate material, which must be entirely developed or formed in an exterior way, as is clay by the artist's hand or stone by the weather's elemental forces. It is rather a living formative root, which possesses within itself the driving power, an inner form, toward development in a particular direction. The seed must grow and ripen into the perfect gestalt, the perfect creation, she says. Continuing, thus envisioned, formation of the spirit is a developmental process similar to that of a plant. However, the plant's organic growth and development do not come about wholly from within. There are also exterior influences which work together to determine its formation, such as climate, soil, etc. Just so, in the soul's formation, exterior factors as well as interior ones play a role. So, Edith Stein draws our attention to the fact that a soul, the spirit of a person, contains within itself an interior direction, the capacity to grow toward a certain organic maturity, and that this is so regardless of any activity of the will. If a child is a living thing, an animated thing, it has an anima. And before we have decided about rationality, we might at least accord it the dignity of a living organism. And as such, make accommodation for the fact that exterior influences matter a great deal. For the garden model, the whole job of the school is to provide the circumstances favorable to natural, organic, self-propelled growth to maturity. Parents and educators are agents, but sort of passive agents, not active agents like the artisan in the first model. They have agency in setting the stage or preparing the environment as Maria Montessori would have put it, but they're not engaged in forming the plant or parting a stamp any more than a gardener would claim that the tree or the fruit is his own creation. Children are still passive in this model, but in contrast to the cages or the refineries, there is a pattern of individual expression one soil or environment will not be equally effective or good for all children. What is required to call forth healthy organic growth in each, possibly being quite different. The garden model, of course, is easy to imagine once we are clear about what it means to have inner directed organic or natural growth. And we can see, uh, for instance, how much um, proponents of alternative schooling pedagogies across the spectrum um, adopt this, this idea as important um, to reforming education. No matter how nat natural it is to think of schools in this way, the garden model is fairly inimitable to the factory model. So 
much so that the language of weeds is not infrequently employed to analogize the reality that factory schools cannot tolerate or support organic growth. Consider, for instance, Noam Chomsky's cheeky observation that the whole educational and professional training system is a very elaborate filter and just weeds out people who are too independent and who think for themselves and who don't know how to be submissive and so on because they're dysfunctional to the institutions. The third model is at once the most ineffable, the furthest from contemporary imagination and the most challenging to the ideas which formed the basis of the 19th century push for state intervention in schooling. This is the school as conversation, which I shall argue is the non-reducible principal element of a school as a mother. Michael Oakeshott put it as follows, education properly speaking is an initiation into the skill and partnership of the conversation of civilization in which we learn to recognize the voices, to distinguish the proper occasions of utterance, and in which we acquire the intellectual and moral habits appropriate to conversation. To understand Oakeshott, it is tempting to lean on the Socratic image for this model, perhaps tutoring lessons imparted through purposeful guided dialogue, but this is quite wrong. What Oakeshott has in mind is something a great deal more interesting calls this talk without a conclusion, conversation where he says, and I quote, nobody asks participants where they have come from or on what authority they are present. Nobody cares what will become of them when they have played their part. There is no symposiarch or arbiter, not even a doorkeeper to examine credentials. Every entrant is taken at its face value and everything is permitted which can get itself accepted into the flow of speculation. Conversation is not an enterprise designed to yield an extrinsic profit a contest where winner gets a prize, nor is it an activity of exegesis. It is an unrehearsed intellectual adventure. In it, different universes of discourse meet, acknowledge each other, and enjoy an oblique relationship which neither requires nor forecasts their being assimilated to one another. I couldn't help but have in mind something like dinner table conversation in a big family when I was thinking about what Oakshot describes here. In any case, what seems to be essential to this conversation is the loving communication between persons, indeed a communication of persons who accept each other and enjoy each other. A contemplation, in fact, although Oakshot does not use that language, what he also says without saying so is that if the end point of, of education is contemplation, contemplation of nature, natural science, contemplation of beauty, natural art, then the preparation must also be contemplative and contemplative at least in some way in mode. The medium is the message. Of course, the original mode of contemplation for a human person is conversation with another, the mother, in the first place, whose heartbeat and face is the first imprint of all creation in the infant. An important question remains, just what is taking place in this conversation, this talk without a conclusion? A preparation we have seen, but of what sort? Not a stamping or molding like the artisan and not a growing like the gardener, then what? To see this note in contrast to the other models, here, the child is an active participant, creative, experiencing, building, imagining, reacting, repeating, and so forth. The child engaged in, as Oakshot presents it, is awakened to freedom. And the end of this awakening, if guided in the correct environment, is the development of the personality, the supporting virtue of which is self-knowledge. Oakshot cites a, a former master of Eton College, William Corey, who was master um, and preci at precisely the same time that Nassau Sr. was writing and speaking. Um, and William Corey further explicates the move from conversation to self-knowledge as the distinctive work of a school. He says, quote, at school, you are not engaged so much in acquiring knowledge as in making mental efforts under criticism. 
A certain amount of knowledge you can indeed with average faculties acquire so as to retain, nor need you regret the hours you spend on much that is forgotten. For the shadow of lost knowledge at least protects you from many illusions. But you go to a great school not so much for knowledge as for arts and habits, for the habit of attention, for the art of expression, for the art of assuming at a moment's notice a new intellectual position, for the art of entering quickly into another person's thoughts, for the habit of submitting to censure and refutation, for the art of indicating assent or dissent in graduated terms, for the habit of re regarding minute points of accuracy, for the art of working out what is possible in a given time, for taste, discrimination, for mental courage, mental soberness. And above all, you go to a great school for self-knowledge. Evidently, we have arrived now at a mode of human activity distinctive to this third model of schooling, which leads to the possession of faculties of personality under the right exercise of freedom. In short, liberal education. To return to the original question, just what is taking place? Oakshot says, nobody asks them where they have come from or on what authority they are present. This is the realm of being and not of doing. At the dinner table among the family, no one asks why the eight-year-old is present. This is the realm of presence and not of power, of enjoyment and not of use. In short, the third primal story of education is predicated upon a metaphysical relationship which activates the faculties of the soul, including the cognitive, emotional, and spiritual elements. The source and the paradigm for this conversation with no purpose is the mother. It is her distinct activity which initiates this process, the very beginning, and to her role that all great formative institutions relate their own activity, schools heralded as alma mater. Indeed, conversation with no purpose but the enjoyment of the other is the constitutive form of human relation in the home. Without becoming too cute, I might notice for this audience how much the activity of fathers is more like the activity of the artisan imparting form or stamp and how much together their life as husband and wife creates the right environment for a child to thrive, the garden for the child. We can press this too far, but these frameworks are useful. Now that we have asked what schools do, we may also ask where and how schools may do their work. Grant now that schooling is some activity that takes place between infancy and the domestic confinement of the child and legal maturity entrance into society. Shall we imagine then that schools are an extension or continuation of the domestic activity or rather are they an apprenticeship to society or initiation into civil society? Suppose now also we take seriously that a good school must facilitate activities proper to the three models. If we view schools then as initiation into public society, we certainly can obtain what is proper to the first two models, since there is nothing especially intimate about these. But we cannot easily obtain a basis for metaphysical relationships of being in public society. On the other hand, if we view schools in a, as an extension of the home, the activities of the first two models obtain easily, and the third is eminently satisfied. The question might be helpfully rephrased as follows. Is a school a place where a child relates to the community as a member who dwells within, whose relationship is one of membership? No one asks where they came from and belonging. Or does the child relate to the community as a member who does a skill practices to do a skill, a tradable, marketable skill? Are the constitutive activities of the school domestic or economic? Whatever we decide, it is not a distinction without a difference. Whether schools belong to the life of the home or to the life of society, the public, determines responsibility and therefore rights over schools.
I said that I would say something about C.S. Lewis. And so now I will connect these models of schooling, in fact, to C.S. Lewis's work in the abolition of man. In the Riddle Memorial Lectures delivered in February of 1943, eventually published as The Abolition of Man, C.S. Lewis argued that whatever we may say about man's power over nature, applied science turns out to be rather a power exercised by some men over other men with nature as its instrument. Curiously, as regards contraceptives, he said, there is a paradoxical negative sense in which all possible future generations are the patients or subjects of a power wielded by those already alive. By contraception simply, they are denied existence. By contraceptives used as a means of selective breeding, they are, without their concurring voice, made to be what one generation for its own reasons may choose to prefer. Lewis further points out, all long-term exercises of power, especially in breeding, must mean the power of earlier generations over later ones. This point is not always sufficiently emphasized, he says, because those who write on social matters have not yet learned to imitate the physicists by always including time among the dimensions. Lewis, characteristically brilliant, gives a nod to the social philosophers who did, in fact, think about time, the economist. But Lewis helps us to an important insight. Mistakes which enter the social genome, the reproductive pattern of civilization, are special kinds of mistakes, which not only infect, but adapt and reproduce, like social viruses. Contraceptives are one kind of social mistake, and getting it wrong about education is another. Of course, Lewis's ultimate target in the Riddle Memorial Lectures was, I quote, a new natural philosophy, a regenerate science, he claimed, which when it speaks of the parts, it would remember the whole, a science which is finally recovered from the slavish impulse of magicians to subdue reality to the wishes of men. In contrast, the wisdom tradition had aimed, he said, at quite the opposite, and, he quote, and I quote, to conform the soul to reality through, quote, knowledge, self-discipline, and virtue. Though Lewis says, and I quote, I hardly know what I'm asking for. He is sure that in this regenerate science, truth would be prized over power and love of truth habituated over love of power. Most of all, the new science of science, as Lewis imagines it, would not even do to minerals and vegetables what modern science threatens to do to man himself. When it explained, it would not explain away. In short, Lewis asks for a new science of man, which has not wholly removed the contemplative or conversational aspect from its own project. It is instructive that Lewis took educational crisis as pointing to a deeper crisis related to science, nature, and man's place in the same. Lewis's abolition ought to be placed in a genre of post-war efforts to rally the academy to a new science. Indeed, he is not alone. Recall the ninth, Friedrich Hayek's 1952, The Counter-Revolution of Science, Eric Vogelin's 1952, The New Science of Politics, Popper's many works, including his 1934, The Logic of Scientific Discovery, De Juvenal's 1963, The Pure Theory of Politics, and Buchanan's 1964, What Should Economists Do? And to this, you can add many more. Lewis and these new science peers, who, by the way, occupied utterly diverse religious positions, were wrestling with what seems to them an almost relentless abuse of science and scientific knowledge distorted in the service of power, military power, economic power, political power, cultural power. Lewis's insight in the Riddle Lectures is that the fatal mistakes about science and nature are entirely coincident with, and indeed co-causal of, the educational failures that we are considering because schooling is the reproductive pattern of civilization. Interesting in this light that Oakeshott in the same essay could not help but remark that, quote, conversation is not only the greatest, but also the most hardly sustained of all the accomplishments of mankind. 
For the most part, he says, the conversation has survived in spite of our notions about the education of the young, which seem to become more and more remote from this understanding of human activity and intercourse. What is needed for the new science, this humane science that Lewis calls for is meaningful restraint in relation to power through subordination to proper ends and purpose or telos. This amounts to saying that science needs to understand its own metaphysical foundations. It needs to cultivate its self-perception, its self-knowledge as being in conversation with the wisdom tradition. The habitus of the new science is a space that is domestic approximating the child who brings a bug to show his father, come see what I have found. The science rejected by Lewis and his peers has no impulse to show a rock or a bug to the father. It has instead wished to see the father itself as another finding of the excited mind. When it explains, it explains away. It does not wish to be conformed, say, to the wisdom of the father, but to form, to make a mark or a stamp. With some effort, we can see that the three primal, that there are three primal modes of science which correspond to three primal modes of schooling. First, science as technology, understood as power in relation to nature, understood as uh, nature itself, understood as matter with no inner form, wholly inanimate, like the child as raw material. Science makes its mark here and leaves its stamp on nature. The second mode, science understands itself to be at least a kind of equal partner to an animate, interdirected nature, which has a life or a power of its own, worthy of respect. In the third mode, science aims instead, or at least in addition, to receive nature as a communication from a person and to communicate with that person in the Okshatian sense. Thus, science as conversation means to remind us of the presence of a voice in the conversation, a voice which seeks not only to inform knowledge, but to delight, to poke fun, to amaze, and to entertain. Surely a science which sees merely as nature, sees nature merely as inanimate matter cannot discern the delightful or humorous notes in the, con in the conversation of nature. Lewis's rejected science inhabits only the first mode. But in the third mode, science is restrained and directed by this communicated telos, an understanding of its own place in the universe and of the meaning of things that exist in the universe. Science itself is conformed to reality, as Lewis says, by a conversation which asks of science not so much knowledge as arts and habits. As with schools, the third mode of science does not preclude the first. Science in conversation with wisdom can still aim to make its mark, to form matter to good and noble purpose. But with the first mode, science understood as mere power cultivated without protection or allowance for the metaphysics of the third this science will invariably lack taste, discrimination, mental courage, and mental soberness. It will slice through nature and man himself with the same exacting tendency, doing after all to minerals and vegetables exactly what it has done to man. It is the thesis, finally, of these remarks that if schools are understood principally after the first model, or even the first and the second together, they will perforce reject the particular conversation which is proper to childhood. And which is also, as it turns out, characteristic of the right relationship with knowledge. If the point of schooling is to impart techne, then the basis for membership in the school is in fact training and skills and education in a kind of power. And schooling itself becomes the technology, a mode of making form and stamp upon nature where the child is analogous to nature. In schools of this kind, the medium and the message, as Gatto implied, are united. The most important consequence of the school as technology is that there is no basis, indeed no opportunity, for the development of freedom in the child, and no basis, indeed no opportunity, for the growth of moral, emotional, and intellectual habits. 
this is not a small nitpicking concern. It seems to me it's the only concern. For habits, virtues of the soul, as William Corey says, are the singular accomplishment which can secure the success of the educational project. For at what else shall a school aim besides the habits and postures of a school? Of the soul. Surely the acquisition of facts stamped in or onto the child have no more relation to education on its own than the branding of an animal has to good husbandry. A fact without habits will surely be lost. Thus, school as technology, or any school which aims at a neutral moral space, neutral morality, which is a neutral metaphysical space, surely fails to be a school at all, as I said at the outset. And this perhaps is the crisis to which Ivan Illich pointed. It may be possible with just enough intellectual effort to see a school, in fact, most schools, not as schools at all, but as animal farms, quite literally, where even the progress from one grade to the next amounts to an inhumane kind of branding of educational advantage. But it is also the thesis of these remarks that what C.S. Lewis missed or at least did not say in his Riddell lectures, is that religion, the church, squares both circles, the science crisis and the education crisis. The reason for this is that religion provides a basis for real membership in a conversation, which is fully in the order of being and not in the order of doing. In a religious school, it is possible to say, you belong, and to also say, you are ours, and nobody asks them where they have come from. Thus, when I said above, or tentatively concluded, that education belongs to the sphere of the domestic and not to the sphere of the public, because education must proceed from the order of being and not from the order of doing, I did not mean to consign schooling to the home. Rather, I meant to provide the reason why religion is not a mere accident or a sideshow to the educational project. The fact is that there is no other way for a school to begin its conversational work outside of a real and not analogous maternal relationship with the child in the order of being. The church is a real and not analogous mother. We belong to the church in a way that we can never belong to the state. Thus, a non-denominational school ought to be read as an oxymoronic expression a self-contradiction, an impossibility, a non-maternal mother. More forcefully, what is needed, I believe, is not religious schools, but environments within the heart of the church where educated men and women invite children into a loving discourse with the wisdom tradition, with the wonders of nature, and with the mystery of the incarnate word in whom God reveals man to himself. Together, if these two theses are correct, then religion is a non-separable or non-reducible essential factor in schooling. Lewis did not go far enough. And later libertarian critics of the public school system, such as E.G. West in the 60s and 70s, or Brian Kaplan in our own time, have a stifled framework that sees only shadows of the truth. Still, I would gladly trade contemporary policy practice for the strictest of libertarian recommendations, which include the full and entire dismantling of the public school system. Ultimately, most of the new science prophets missed the role of religion in reclaiming humane science and education. But Pius XI, Pius XI did not miss it, as marked in the last and only great papal encyclical on education, Divini Ilius Magistri. The school, he urged, a decade and a half before the Lewis Riddle lectures, if not a temple, is a den. Nor did Edith Stein miss this. She was a contemporary, of course, of Pius XI and perished in Auschwitz in 1942, just one year before Lewis delivered his incisive remarks. She said, we learned that there must be an objective basis for the cultural sciences besides the clarification of method an ontology of the spirit corresponding to the ontology of nature. So what would it mean to develop an ontology of the spirit within the sciences? This is a fascinating question. 
Consider Stein's request unanswered. Clarification of method has carried the day. At the very least, it points again to the necessity of the third mode, the metaphysical grounds for the success of the scientific and educational projects, united projects, as I have argued. Edith Stein noted that, quote, the desire to construe a consistent worldview, that is the metaphysical tendency, is fixed in the human mind itself and is strongly apparent even in the mind of a young child. Education, authentic educational work could hardly be spoken of, she says, wherever this tendency is not considered. So surveying the vast, truly epic failures of the public school system, I asked at the outset, what went wrong? But we would, be, we would do better to, to wonder, how could anything have gone right? The answer to that, I suppose, is a testimony to the resilience of the child. The only policy which has not been tried is the only path which honors the humanity of the child, the complete return of educational right and responsibility to the family, every family, including single parents and broken homes, aided by confident religious communities eager to welcome children into the conversation of mankind to the dinner table, if you will. I hear your objection. Our religious communities are not confident and robust. Noted, I say, but necessity being the mother of invention, such a policy may just foster the very communities it requires. Having removed the function, are we surprised that the organ withers? In fact, Catholic schools have been in decline in number and enrollment since a peak in the early 1960s when more than 5.2 million students around or around 10% of school children were enrolled in approximately 13,000 schools. Today, Catholic schools enroll only about 1.8 million students or about 3% of the total school children in the United States. The consequences of the COVID debacle have only accelerated this trend. The Wall Street Journal reported in April, just passed, um, a 6.4% decline in Catholic school enrollment in 2020, the largest decline since the data has been tracked. Soberly, some of you may know that almost 10% of Boston Archdiocesan schools have closed in the last year. By way of conclusion, I want to say there has been a great deal of interest in the last few decades in the subject of the challenges to citizenship that modernity has thrust upon Catholics in America. With more than a nod to McIntyre's after virtue, Rod Dreher's argued for a Benedict option. And long before Dreher, the end of democracy symposium at First Things put the question in stark color, whether and to what extent Catholics can accept terms of citizenship in a political regime that among other things, provides a constitutional defense of the slaughter of innocents. This debate currently hangs on various questions related to political liberalism and the extent to which the American project is now or ever was bound up with the same. But this new interest in the political question as compared with say in the mid century era in which Catholics in general seemed quite overcome with how well things were going, this new interest in the political has struck me of late as a little bit misplaced or maybe out of order. What I mean is this, let's say for the sake of argument that there is some ambiguity as to the question of Catholics in the American political enterprise. Let's also say after reflecting on the last major encyclical on Christian education, which of course I had not the time to cover tonight, Pius XI's Divini Ilius Magistri, but this, of course, makes an unflinching argument that schooling is under no circumstances to be left to the public order. Let's then say that there is absolutely no ambiguity about whether and to what extent Catholics can participate in the system of government schools favorably called public schools. If this is the case, then that 3% number is a pretty good measure of our correspondence to a necessary form of Christian, a necessary norm of Christian life educate the children. So here is my question. How can we work out our obligations with respect to things which are ambiguous, such as the place of Catholics in political life, 
when we have not been able to carry out a much more straightforward task, which is to refuse to let, in Pius XI's words, an education hostile to Christ profane the temple of the child's soul. The logic of Divini Ilius Magistri is that Catholic schools are prior to the state. Catholic schools are prior to the state since they are a proper activity of families and churches, each of which is prior to the state. Therefore, questions about the political question are always downstream from the success or failure of Christian schools. What we are seeing now is quite likely, I think, the playing out of a sequence predicted quite perfectly by Pius XI in his profound letter on the Third Reich, in which he wrote, quote, the church cannot wait, he wrote, to deplore the devastation of its altars and the destruction of its temples if an education hostile to Christ is to profane the temple of the child's soul. For then, the violation of its temples is near. But I can hear you object. Can we really tease out what is the effect of a rotten political order from what is the effect of a rotten educational order? Surely at some point they become hopelessly entangled. One might even make a strong argument that a rotten political order gave rise to the rotten educational order through, for instance, choking off religious schools in just the manner that Pius XI decries. And this would be true. But here in the United States, US Catholic parents, clergy and bishops bear responsibility too. We mostly accepted this corrupt arrangement with precious little resistance. We were mostly willing to go along with the romance of the public school system. As Catholics, we marched in Washington for civil rights and for unborn rights, but not for the rights of religious schools. We basically agreed with Tom Brokaw when he said that public schools are the great common ground, the engine that moves us toward a common destiny. Common destiny indeed. In fact, it is very difficult to find any Catholic or Christian leader of the last half century who has urged a complete severing of ties with the American public school system on the order of what is clearly required by Divini Elias Magistri. Even Alistair McIntyre, whose prophetic work inspired so many, has spent a large portion of his intellectual energies advocating for more and better public education. Perhaps, I say, we do not need a new Benedict. We need a new and doubtless different Elizabeth Seaton. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dominic Casella, and I'm the executive director at the Center for the Restoration of Christian Culture here at the Thomas More College of Liberal Arts. Thank you for watching this program. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to learn more about the center and how to support it, please visit us at restorationchristianculture.org. There you can subscribe to our newsletter and also Phil Lawler's Book of the Month Club. We hope you enjoyed this program, and I look forward to seeing you at the next. God bless and take care.